Um, these are several people have given freely of their time and energy over many years and um, in order to bring the work of Jungian psychology to our community. And I'd like to just take the opportunity tonight to acknowledge um, Penelope Tarasuk and Erica Lorenz, our speaker tonight, and Ed Tick, who we'll be seeing later in February, and thank them for their dedication and service. Um, our lecture series is powered by you and your interest and by your contributions, whether through our new uh, admission options or a direct monetary gift, which you can make through our website. We welcome your participation in helping us with the nuts and bolts of running this lecture series. So please connect with me through my email, which is listed in the chat. If you would like to help us with flyering or consult with us on fundraising ideas, or if you have other ideas for ways to pr promote our mission in the community. In February and May, we'll be live in Seeley Hall in on the campus of Smith College. Once again, looking forward to that. Um, and in January, our very next presentation will be a fairy tale uh, guided, we'll, uh, Angie Brenner will be guiding us through the fairy tale for that meeting. And I'm going to hand it over to Elric Walker to introduce tonight's speaker, Erica Lorenz. Thank you, Christine. Um, Erica Lorenz is going to be presenting tonight Jung on non ordinary states and the subtle body. Erica Lorenz is a Jungian analyst, a training analyst on the training board at the C.G. Jung Institute of New England. She has been an adjunct faculty member at Antioch New England Graduate School of Professional Psychology and a training analyst with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. Erica has been featured on Pacifica Radio and the Jung platform. Her area of expertise is working with the embodied mythopoetic process in analysis. Since 1986, she has lectured and taught workshops throughout the US and Canada. She has served brilliantly for the past 10 years as president of the Jung Association of Western Massachusetts, and she continues her private practice in Amherst, Massachusetts. I will also add that Erica is presently working on a book. I've had the pleasure of reading some of the chapters and I'm very excited for that to come forward. And now without further ado, please welcome Erica Lorenz. Thank you. Thank you, Elric, eloquent as usual. And Chris and every all of the board members and Andy, our Zoom host. And I just wanted to mention when we go back to Smith, we will be hybrid. So you'll be able to do Zoom or come to Smith. So, so okay, so one of the things that's important is I have permission to present certain experiences of clients and, and colleagues and friends that have given me some material so that we can try to understand from inside what I'm talking about. I'm also in throughout this, I'm going to be showing some of um, the paintings in the Red Book, Jung's paintings, which are really phenomenal paintings. And they're not in a particular order. They, I just put them in when it seemed appropriate. So let me light our, our, our candle to start. I always like to have a candle lighting. And put it back here on the little altar. Okay. I'm going to share here. Share screen. Okay. How do I get out all this? Da, da, da. We don't need that. We don't need that. And we don't need that. Okay. Good. Move you over there. All right, here we go. 
Whoops, I don't see it doesn't work that way. No, okay. Okay, so let's just sit for a minute and sort of collect ourselves and just feel yourself in the chair so you can sort of leave the day behind and begin to come into what we're speaking about and we will be sharing, I hope, some of this. So let's just take a big breath and just feel the nice solid chair underneath you. And just notice your breathing. And just take this poem in. The body is made of earth and gold, sky and stars, rivers and oceans, masquerading as muscle and bone. Every substance is here. The body is made of earth and gold, sky and stars, rivers and oceans, masquerading as muscle and bone. Every substance is here. That's from the Radiance Seminar, Radiance Sutras. Okay. Jung wrote, in archetypal conceptions, meaning sim the sim our symbols, our imaginal realm, our dreams, our synchronicities, in archetypal conceptions and instinctual perceptions, spirit and matter confront one another on the psychic plane. Matter and spirit both appear in the psychic realm as distinctive qualities of conscious contents, which means symbols, synchronicities, dreams. The ultimate nature of both matter and spirit is transcendental. The, the ultimate nature of, of the body is transcendental. Not only in the psychic man, the psychic man is the whole spiritual and psychological person. Is there something unknown, but also in the physical? Precisely because the psychic and the physical are mutually dependent, it has often been conjectured that they may, may be identical somewhere beyond our present experience. So let me just, sorry. Let me just say a few words about where, where I got connected to this and why I'm uh, doing this. My experience is, as a child, I, I was in a very small Pennsylvania mountain town and I went to the church of my mother and father and I was very bored and fought with my Sunday school teachers and Christianity did not impress me at the time. And um, there, I went through a period of time running out of the church and running all the way home crying. And looking back, I understand that. Well, I knew that I wanted God, but I knew that God didn't live in this church. So, um, and then and when I was 16, I went cross country with a family to go to Disney World and we got to the Badlands and I just became dumb. I just was, something opened in me and I was speechless. And we went over the Rocky Mountains and I was just, I was a teary the whole way over the Rocky Mountains. When I got home, I sat in the backyard in the dark for three nights in a row. And I said to the dark, who am I and what am I doing here? And the third night I said, I'm not going to leave this spot until you tell me who I am and what I'm doing here. And suddenly there was a shift of perception and opening of the doors of perception and I deeply knew who I was and what I was doing here. And it was just calm and quiet and centered and peaceful. And that faded in about a couple of months, which these things usually do. And I had no one to talk to. That's a problem with our modern culture, which is what Jung was trying to rectify. There, is, there was no one to talk to to say, what was that? How do I get it back? What do I do? So in 1986, I moved to Houston, Texas after a series of very important synchronistic events that said, well, you know, you don't have to, but we strongly advise this. And in the spring of 1987, I developed these horrendous headaches. And the headaches, um, I, they were not medical. I went to doctors, nothing helped, no drug helped, nothing helped. 
And I was getting body work and various alternative things to try to work with this. With this. And a, a Feldenkrais guy said, you, you feel like a woman in menopause in menopause going through a tran deep for transformative process. And my authentic movement teacher that I actually knew in Northampton um, had come to, uh, to Houston to do a workshop and I hadn't seen her in 10 years and we greeted each other beautifully and she was very happy to see me. And authentic movement is the Jungian form of movement work. There is no direction, there is no music. You simply close your eyes and tune into the impulse from the body and allow that to guide you. And as soon as I was in her witnessing presence, my movement totally deepened and I went through a series of five years of awakening Kundalini. I would go out to California where she lived then for four or five days at a time, about four or five times a year. And I would just do these descents into my body and uh, into this energy that was trying to move through me. And I had no fear. I was very supported by my analyst and my ex who happened to be a Jungian analyst back then. And it, I, it was, it was, very powerful and it changed my life. And after that, I was training to be an analyst and I wanted to know what Jung said about this. So he said a lot about this and that's why I'm sharing this. And I did my thesis on Jung spirituality in the body. And while I was researching this and writing my thesis, many clients would come to me and say, I'm having weird experiences. And I would say, well, Tell me your weird experience. And as Janet always said to me, I would say, these aren't weird. These are altered states. It's, it's just a another way of the transcendent speaking to you in your body. So I want to mention psychedelic psychotherapy because it's very important. It's very big. Tons of research is being done. Penelope has... Uh, done a training program with it, and she's talked about it and will be. And it's amazing work. It's truly amazing work. It can really help some people who can't be helped in other ways. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about here, because for Jung, he didn't need psychedelics. He did not do psychedelics. He didn't need them. He did this from childhood. And we can also access the psychedelic realm, the mystical realm, the imaginal realm, without psychedelics. And there are ways to do that. Some people, this is very easy. Some people, it's more difficult. But to me, that's what the Jungian path is about. It's about accessing the childhood issues and the trauma and all of that and working through it. But at the, at the core of the childhood issue and the trauma is the transcendent, is the self, is the archetypal. So there, there are ways to do this. Um, authentic movement, groff, breath work, continuum, um, and working with dreams, active imagination, which is what Jung did. And we all have a religious function of the psyche. Every human being has a religious function of the psyche that is natural. So Jungian work is not about spiritual bypass. We know plenty of people who are oh so spiritual. It's about the wholeness. It's about uh, the, the issues we have and the transcendent. Nathan schwartz Salant says, this shift to an in-between realm known in pre-scientific cultures as the subtle body requires an active choice to leave rational consciousness so as to apprehend the nature and dynamics of the field. The field is the energy. We feel it. The imaginal, the energy, um, the emotion. Focusing on the field through the openness of an aperspectival awareness, one may perceive stored information in the unus mundus, in the source, in God, in the transcendent, whatever you want to call it. Aperspectival awareness is when we soften our eyes, we soften our body, we are open to what needs to come in. Okay, so let's talk about Jung. Like I said, Jung did not need psychedelics. He was a part, he experienced archetypal reality 
and non-ordinary state since he was a child. His mother was psychic. His father was a very poor pastor, and Jung was very disappointed that his father's faith was very simplified and um, rigid, and his wasn't. So I'm, I'm sharing this about Jung, and we will be sharing whatever we want to share, but we're not here to think of it, analyze it. I just want you to let it in and see what resonates, see what feels familiar or alien or whatever. Jung's first dream that he remembered was at the age of four. He walks across a field. He goes downstairs into a cave. There's a red carpet. He crosses the room. There's a golden throne. And on this golden throne is a huge phallus. Now, the phallus is the spermatica, the a masculine creative force. And Jung says he never totally understood this dream, but what he did feel feel that the phallus was partly, besides the spermatica, was this ancient, ancient god that he met in the unconscious, which who incorporates the complex the complexia oppositorum, the good and the bad, the complexity of God. So that was his first dream, not a childhood dream, an archetypal dream. Nature was very important to Jung. My small village bathed in sunlight with the winds and the clouds moving over it was God's world, so ordered by him and filled with secret meaning. Jung grew up Christian and all of his life he tried to understand really what was the core, what was the underpinnings, what was the real um, reality of Christianity and all religions. He studied religions from everywhere. Um, shamanism, spirituality, mythology. At the age of 14, his father bought him a tram ticket to ascend an alpine peak, and he could only afford one. When Jung got up to the top, he was speechless with joy. Yes, this is it, my world, the secret, where one can be without having to ask anything. It was all very solemn, and I felt one had to be polite and silent up here, for one was in God's world. So this is a uh, painting of his. The initiate is at the bottom with the, of this erupting unconscious. And this happens to be fire. But um, I'm going to talk about a vision he had when he was about 12. And this is with the help, the uh, help of a colleague of mine in London, Heba Zarifi who wrote this. When he was on his way back from school one day, he saw God sitting on a throne in heaven. From under the throne, an enormous, this is going to sound very strange for a lot of us, an enormous turd falls on the sparkling new roof of the cathedral and shatters it, breaking the walls of the cathedral asunder. He recalls being tormented for three days and nights by thoughts he was unable to give space to in his mind. How could God destroy his church in this manner? And how could Jung, the young schoolboy, dare to think such a thought? Or was it or was it God will to have Jung think these thoughts? And here's a, a, um, a painting, it's called The Ancient of Days. Was it God who induced him to sin by thinking the unthinkable? Finally, God succumbed to welcome the unthinkable sinful thought by the end of the third day. It brought great relief and much to his surprise, a state of blissful grace instead of the frightful fall from grace. He felt that by allowing the fantasy to enter his mind, he was fulfilling God's will. This was a direct experience of the deity. But God's inquisitive mind did not rest for long, and however relieved he felt, he could not fathom why God would befoul his own cathedral, and why such a thought was to be forced upon him. Was God calling for disobedience? God could indeed be terrible. And this is an image of perhaps the God that Jung encountered in the unconscious. The forms of existence inside and outside time are so sharply divided that crossing this boundary presents the greatest of difficulties like Jung had in this experience. 
But this does not exclude the possibility that there is an existence outside time that runs parallel with the existence inside time. So we are in a three-dimensional reality. And Jung postulated that the collective unconscious, we are in the, we can feel into our personal unconscious, but the collective unconscious was beyond that. Yes, we ourselves may simultaneously exist in both worlds. So Jung, about this time, realized that he had a, two personalities. Now, we all have several personalities. This is what the psyche is about. And he realized he was this schoolboy who did everything at school and was a good boy. And then inside of him, he had this image of an old man from the 18th century who was timeless, imperishable, close to nature, living creatures, night, dreams, whatever God worked directly in him. And I think that this was the beginning in his childhood of what later in the black books and the red book, which are his experiences, that he called the spirit of the times, the uh, our outward being, and the spirit of the depths who invited him and actually pulled him into the unconscious. He became a psychiatrist and his thesis was written on parapsychology. His cousin did seances and he attended and he was very interested in what was going on and that's what he wrote his thesis on. He became a psychiatrist at the Bear Colesley Clinic in Zurich, which was one of the most progressive clinics in, in Europe. And he worked with psychotics. This is important. Freud worked with hysterics who were only considered to be women at the time. But Jung worked with people who were connected to the collective unconscious, the archetypal world. And the difference between a mystic and a, a psychotic is a mystic knows the threshold. They can go into the collective unconscious, come out and integrate what happened. A psychotic does not have the ego strength or the uh, conscious awareness to be able to go into the unconscious and come out. In 1906, Jung met Freud and they talked for 13 hours. I would have loved to have listened to that conversation. And their relationship only lasted four years. And this is because Jung began to realize that Freud didn't know about the archetypal world. He, he conjectured about it a little bit, but he had, didn't really experience it, didn't really understand it. He thought religion was a neurosis. And so the, the final uh, thing came when they were on a, an ocean liner going across the ocean so he, they could speak at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. And they were sharing dreams and Jung asked Freud for some of his associations. And Freud said, I cannot risk my authority. And that was the last straw for Jung. He just realized even though he was the president of the whole psychoanalytic society and he was the editor of the, the um, journal, he could not, he needed to go his own way. So they separated. And Jung had, this is one of his paintings, an inundation from the collective unconscious starting at this point. You can see the, the primitive and the spiritual, all of the unconscious. In 1913, he had two very powerful visions. He saw blood just streaming over Europe with the rubble of the civilization floating in it. And these visions lasted about an hour each and he came out of them very perplexed and nauseated. So we can see it's not just in his head, he's actually feeling something. And he, um, he realized at the advent of World War I that this was um, speaking of World War I, but he also realized later that it was the advent of his own inundation, his own flooding from the unconscious. Jung wrote, to the extent that I managed to translate the emotions into images, I was inwardly calmed and reassured. In 1913, he made his first descent into the unconscious. He chose, he felt this tremendous emotional and energetic pressure, and he chose to close his eyes and allow this energy to take him. And he had his first act of imagination. It's active because he wasn't sleeping. He was choosing consciously to go there. 
He dropped into a cave. There was a glowing red crystal. He picked it up and he looked through a hollow and underneath was a river of blood with, with a corpse running through it and a black scarab and a new red newborn sun. Now these are very powerful symbols of transformation. Then a, a little later, he had a, a very important dream. He dreamt that the war hero Siegfried, the Nordic war hero Siegfried was charging down a hill he was standing at the bottom with a Native American man. The Native American man picked up his bow and arrow and shot Siegfried dead, and it started to rain. Jung woke up, and the unconscious said to him, you better understand this dream, or you need to take the pistol out of the drawer of your nightstand and kill yourself. Well, Jung decided to understand the dream. And what he understood was that this hero was his shadow, his hero spirit. He had a, quite a warrior spirit, and he needed to let go of that, that he could not go into the unconscious as the hero. He had to go into the unconscious with openness and receptivity and the ability to listen and um, not judge. Now, he wrote all of his experiences in his journals, which were published a couple of years ago, called the Black Books. And then later he uh, transferred them in calligraphy to the Red Book. I'm sure some of you have seen the Red Book and then he painted. And um, I know uh, the man, a man who co-translated uh, the Black Books and Red Books. And when the Black Books came out, when he was working on them, he said, Erica, you need to read the Black Books because the Black Books really speak to what he was experiencing, his emotion. So Jung met at the beginning, uh, a, he had a soliloquy to his soul. This is an image of his soul or his anima. My soul, where are you? Do you hear me? I have returned. I am here again. The one thing I have learned is that one must live this life. This life is the way, the long sought after way to the unfathomable, which we call divine. There is no other way. It led me to you, my soul. Give me your hand, my almost forgotten soul. My journey should continue with you instead of the hero. That's my addition. I had judged my soul and turned her into a scientific object. I needed to call upon her as a living and self-existing being. He whose desire turns away from outer things reaches the place of the soul. I went on my dusty way by day. You went invisibly with me and guided me step by step, putting the pieces together meaningfully and letting me see the whole and ultimate in each part. You took away where I thought to take hold. You gave me where I did not expect anything. And again, you brought about fate from new and unexpected quarters. You upheld my belief when I was alone and near despair. At every decisive moment, you let me believe in myself. The soul knows her own way better and no intention can prescribe a better one for her. This is a beautiful picture by Peter Berkhauser of the soul. Jung wrote, people do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own souls. They'll buy things, they'll invest in the stock market, they'll look for power, and not have the slightest faith that anything useful could come out of their own soul. It is rewarding to watch patiently the silent happenings in the soul, and the most and best happens when it is not regulated from the outside and from above. I have such great respect for what happens in the human soul that I would be afraid of disturbing and distorting the silent operations of nature by clumsy interference. Now, Jung met many characters in the unconscious, Salome, his anima and Elijah, his who was uh, uh, with Salome, who was from the Bible. He met his child anima, his soul, of course. His soul was a major guide throughout the entire thing. 
And this whole journey lasted from 1913 to 1917. He met shadow figures, an anchorite, a red man or the devil, the death, the drunken man. He met a god from the Bronze Age. This is a painting, is Isdubar, who he helped. He put him, he made him uh, shrink so he could put him in his pocket. It's a wonderful story. And he met Philemon, the wise old man, his, his guide. When Jung went to India, he was talking to some uh, gurus. And one of them was talked about his own guru. And Jung said, but he died. And the guru said, yes, he did. He was, he was an inside guide. And Jung then, that was confirmation that he had this inner guide. And Philemon, when Jung built his uh, Bollingen Tower, this beautiful stone tower at the end of Lake Zurich, and his study was on the top floor, he painted Philemon on the wall, and underneath it he wrote, the primordial father of the prophets. Okay, I am going to share with you the experience of a uh, friend of mine years ago that we can see a modern day experience of this. So this is a man who was an environmental lawyer in California, he still is, and he was also a very devout Buddhist. And this is an authentic movement where again, he's just listening to his own body. As I enter the movement, I think of the importance to me of knowing what's happening and where things are going. We can relate to that. What would it be like to live on the edge of the unexpected? As I lie on the floor, I feel the need to stretch different parts of my body. I extend and spread my legs, extend my torso to feel more space between my ribs, reach my arms out as far as possible. I feel my body lengthen and open. It feels delicious. I roll, stretch, and extend. I love this spacious feeling. I don't want to become entangled with other movers. As I move, I feel my body rising up from the floor to my knees. I reach to the sky. My body rises again to my feet like I've been picked up by a gentle, powerful, invisible force. I stand tall, my arms reach back, my head tilts back, and a deep, screechy, mournful howl rises up from me and out of me into the fullness of the room and the sky. It comes repeatedly and contrasts with other harmonious sounds in the room. The howl has its own power. It calls to the moon like the coyote in the night has called for thousands of years. It continues through the coyote and through me. I feel magnificent. Something has released in me. Welcome the unexpected in me. I move in the harmony of contacts with other movers no struggle, no resistance. These are his reflections on this. My mind and body are often constricted by my need to control circumstances and be on top of things. The movement, especially the stretching and the howls come unexpectedly and a surprise. It reminds me of my need to let go and listen for or await some deeper wisdom that comes through me from unknown places in my body. There is so much freedom and relief in the unexpected howl when I allow myself to be open to the unexpected and experience it fully. It brings freedom and release for me. It allows me to live more in the moment. This movement experience has come repeatedly to me on the movement floor. It also is recollected in my daily life and reminds me to let go, howl in whatever I'm doing, and reap the riches of the unexpected. I find that it allows me to be more at ease and grounded in my life. Nathan Schwartz Jung says, the physiological unconscious, the so-called somatic unconscious, which is the subtle body, becomes material because the body is the living unit and our conscious and the unconscious are embedded in it. The physiological unconscious, the so-called somatic unconscious, which is the subtle body, becomes material 
because the body is the living unit and our conscious and the unconscious are embedded in it. So I'm going to stop sharing and come back to everybody. Um, let's see. And gallery view. How do I get rid of that? Okay. And I'm really curious about what people are thinking, what people, what questions you have. And another thing that I would love to do tonight is whatever you feel like of sharing some of your own experiences. They don't have to be powerful and amazing like some of these. I know for me, when I'm standing on the, on the ocean, when I'm standing on the shore, I'm just filled with a profound sense of infinity and, and wholeness and, and depth and mystery. So I'd just like to bring this into our, our lives, into the room about how, how this happens in your life or what thoughts or, um, or questions you have. And um, I prefer people share not psychedelic experiences, though they're very powerful, but what we're focusing on here is that this happens without that. This can happen in our daily lives and when we, when we go into the inner world or even in nature. So we're not going to interpret anybody. We're not going to analyze any. This is just a sharing and honoring and respecting. So who would like to ask a question or share? Just raise your hand. This is a lot of material. Laura has her hand up. Sorry. Laura, you want to unmute? Yeah, I just did. Okay. So I'm um, just thinking about these, the times when I, I feel um, there are these times that, that, um, that feel quite wonderful to me in a sense of having, where I, I'm overtaken by images and, or, um, so I'll either be for sleep or sometimes even just if I'm, you know, tired or, and I close my eyes and it'll be like one, one image and then another and then another and another. And I have no idea where they're coming from. They're very mm -hmm. random. They're not familiar. Mm -hmm. And the feeling that I get when that happens is one of just sort of fascination and like riding these waves. Mm -hmm. Where I where it's it's just such a a re, a, a pleasurable experience of letting go of and just letting these things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have two thoughts that come up, not about what they what they are or anything, but you said something that I think is helpful. Sometimes when we're tired or when something very intense has happened in our life, or um, uh, when we're more open to the unconscious is often when it comes up. Um, and also we, we all come like you have images. Jung was very, had images and he also was auditory. Um, he was very visual and auditory. I'm very kinesthetic. I have more energy experiences. So we all have particular ways that we connect with the subtle body that are unique to our own they're kind of our signature so does anybody does that resonate with anybody that there's certain ways that you entered into the unconscious more easily or hear the unconscious or hear the mystery yeah penny sorry yeah i unmute penny I think I've been very distracted from some of my normal um, non-ordinary states by pain and by the election and politics and, you know, the collective trauma. But I, on my um, visit to Seattle, when I spent time with my sons, I had a number of auditory experiences. And it was simply, I heard a voice that said, this is heaven. And it was utterly simple. It was about being present to the moment 
There was nothing fancy about it whatsoever, but that voice came probably about seven times where it was just, this is heaven. And that was very unusual. I don't usually get auditory experiences like that. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Darlene, you have, uh, Andy, I'm seeing some people. So if you see people, feel free. Darlene, you want to unmute? Yeah. Hello, everyone. So I find when I am in these um, moments, um, it's usually I have to be in like very quiet, uh, serene environments. And I find that that those disassociative states for me um, happens like when I'm in the mountains, um, you know, at the beach. Um, but what I find with it is that <clears throat> um, these spirit beings are attracted to me at the same time. And usually they come in the form of birds, for example. Like I recall one mm -hmm. of these times when I was having this dissociation, I was on the beach of Puerto Rico. And I was there for hours, hours, and I had some black birds there. And I found them to be just very spiritual uh, creatures um, where I was kind of aligning, you know, transcending to this larger plane um, or spirit. So I think, you know, these quiet, peaceful, serene moments is when it happens for me. And <clears throat> as of late, I find it happens also a lot when I'm sleeping and dreaming. And just last night, I had a vision of these very important people in my life um, all came out in my dream, um, part of my inner circle. But the one person um, that was kind of uh, in a conflictual way um, in my dream and in my personal life who's very ill, did not come out in the dream, but the message of the dream was very clearly in words, it's in the past, it's in the past. So <clears throat> oftentimes um, these visions come to me, um, these, uh, the, the subconscious, the unconscious uh, kind of manifests itself and comes up to the next level mm -hmm. um, through dreams in very quiet, peaceful, serene moments. Yeah, thank you, Darlene. Yeah, um, I just want to say that I don't see that as dissociation. I see that as subtle body. I think we're we're so into this dissociation thing that I don't think we know the difference. Mm. And I, in my work, mm. I don't see dissociation as bad. I mean, it, we go there at mm. times, but like you weren't just you you were aware you weren't just totally out of it you know so yeah thank you joe do you want to share um uh i want to raise an, an aspect a little different than the the uh going into the uh subconsciousness or the unconsciousness um and um you know, let me give an example, I guess, so I, I can build around it. But um, I, I was in uh, Egypt in the, inside the Great Pyramid, you know, uh, in the King's Chamber uh, with a group of people for a few days. We were allowed to stay there for four hours from 12 to 4 in the morning for two days. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had some interesting, you know, uh, experiences. But the, what I want to bring up now in, in the uh, room there, the king's chamber, there's a sepulcher where you can lie in. It's like lying inside a coffin, except the coffin's made out of a huge granite pink stone. It's mm -hmm. quite long and deep. And uh, the group took turns lying inside of it. And while we each had turns inside of it, the group, there was an opera and there, there are a number of people who could do chanting. Where we went, we often did oming, you know, sounds, a vibration. When, the, when it was my turn inside that stone, the, sitting deep inside the stone, when the group chanted, I experienced a body within me rise up above me. Mm -hmm. And it was not at all anticipating that. It was not something I was saying, oh, I'm going to do something. So I was open to whatever would happen. 
And it was just an amazing experience. Just something inside of me, like my body, rose up. And when the chanting stopped, it, it came back in again. And I just want to give that as an example, put it in a bigger context. You know, in Egypt, Egyptian um, religion, they believe there are two bodies within our regular physical body, the Ka body and the Ba body. Right. And I think this has often been the basis in theosophy that there are actually subtle sheaths within our body. There's a subtle body. And within that subtle body, there's another subtle body. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder to what extent Jung looked into theosophy, which is related to the Egyptian religions and things, that there actually is something, a materiality, Mm -hmm. other than our unconscious, subconscious, which can be uh, created. One often hears stories of Tibetan lamas traveling with their subtle body going places. Mm -hmm. There are instances of people who have near-death experiences and they feel their body actually leaves their body. They can report on the operations or things going on, the world coming back, and people say they have no idea how they could have seen something or done something because they were in the hospital room the whole time. So that's the one aspect I want to put yeah. out. Uh, yeah. well, Joe, Joe, thank you. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, Jung knew about theosophy. It was around when he was, when he was doing his work. Mm -hmm. um, he also knew about Egyptian mythology. So yeah, the subtle body is what we're talking about, yeah. And it doesn't have to be so dramatic, too. I just want to say it's like birds on a beach, you know, that are very spirit. They're spirits. Um, yeah. Anybody else have? No, no, no. One more thing. Okay. Uh, Jung also wrote an introduction to a book of Chinese alchemy, The right. Secret of the Golden Flower, which mm -hmm. is about the creation, the development within oneself of a golden body. Mm -hmm. So what I'm really trying to bring out that we're talking about a different kind of materiality. It's we not are. just the creative, active imagination of the subconscious. I'm talking about material substances that exist really, that are very rare to you know, contact in our society. But yeah. it's a different aspect of, I think, of what you're talking about. It's well, certainly about subtle bodies. Well, but, let me... I'll, I'll yeah. get to, I'll get yeah, to yeah. showing you the how they intersect. Yes, yes please. I like that's my question, really. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. That's a wonderful segue for where we're going. But let's stay with some other people, questions and thoughts. Yes, thank you, Joe. Okay, anybody else? Anne. Yeah, um, this goes in a little bit the other direction, but um, when I was going through a certification program in movement studies, uh, we had some authentic movement experiences, and then we had one that included creating a mask, and it was around Thanksgiving, so this was set up, not Thanksgiving, this was around Halloween, so it was set up as a ritual. Uh, we had to make the mask, be ready to come back with that. And I, um, we could buy part of it. I bought a template that was just, you know, the over the eyes, the standard mask that also had kind of bird feathers. And it looked like to me a bird of prey, but I had to finish the mask and I could not draw a mouth. I could not find any way to do that. And I ended up putting on it a cutout of a, of a lion that covered the mouth and then another one that was over the top. Mm -hmm. And the eyes on the lion weren't intense enough. So I cut out tiger eyes and put them on that. So that the lion tiger was over the mouth. And when I got into the movement experience, uh, it was at night, it was set up with dim light. We had people kind of holding the perimeter of it. And we of course had a witness, which you have in that. And I got, I could only get to the bird and couldn't get past that. And there was a period there where I just felt that my legs wouldn't touch the ground. And then all of a sudden the level of frustration kicked in and I dropped into a totally altered state. And I was that lion tiger. 
I had so much strength and so much power at that point. And I, I prefer vertical movement. I was out there. I was lunging and slamming the leg down. That's, you know, that's not what we usually think of as altered states or the more expansive state in the body. But it it was, it had the same sense of being, um, I was taken over by it. And it lasted for a long period of time. It changed my perception of observations of crystals in a museum because we were also choosing crystals that spoke to us. And I kept going back and they kept changing very rapidly. It was a very transformative experience for me. I don't know that that fits into subtle body. It in does. The- it does. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Like this man with the coyote, you know, he was totally in it. He was immersed in it. It, it took him over. He allowed it to take him over, right? Yeah. yeah. And you were in an altered state. That's a subtle body. That's a non-ordinary state. That's a subtle body state. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sarah. Hi. Um, You might get into this in the next section. So if that's so, wait on the answer. But I guess I'm curious to know why some subtle body and altered state experiences are easier to integrate than others because you know hearing these and thinking about some of my experiences you know they're beautiful and they're kind of rapturous and then you walk away and just have nothing but kind of a um an awe or a, a reverence for what happened and i'm just curious why some states might, might actually have the opposite effect where there's kind of fear or this kind of you know a very different reaction when it's kind of the same material but why it lands differently than than others i don't yeah. know thanks sarah that's a good point because the jung's experiences were not easy his experiences for those four well at least towards the end he was used to going into the unconscious and he was used to having these strange very shamanic experiences actually but it was extremely difficult for many years for jung um, he managed to see some clients. He managed to, but he was he wasn't as fully in the world as he was later. So these these it these things can take over, and it takes a thank you. It takes that's very important because you know I know people who do do psychedelics. They go off on a weekend and they do psychedelics and they come back and oh that was a great trip. Well, that's what we do used to do in the sixties and seventies. I took practically everything in sixties and seventies, and I never had a spiritual experience. They were curious, they were interesting, but but um, but sometimes these are difficult. Sometimes they're so intense. Like Jung, when he began to go in the, into the unconscious, he was he felt this intense pressure and emotion. He was just on the edge of his seat. And he, he chose to follow that. He, and he was terrified. So um, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's difficult. It sort of depends on where, where we are in our life. I think it also depends on how big a transformation we are asked to engage in. You know, sometimes we take little steps. Sometimes we're just thrown into the unconscious like Jung was. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it takes a lot of of work. And and I think fear is a difficult aspect of that because the the fear uh, shuts us down. You know, Mm -hmm. certainly, you know, Jung was scared. So, yeah, just to reassure you that this is not all fun and easy (laughs) (laughs) thank you yeah yeah okay we we have time for one more anybody else want to say anything right now no okay okay so let's go on let me go back to share screen okay uh let's see Okay, now we're going to, I'm going to bring in some help here so we can begin to maybe understand this. So I'm going to talk about brain research, actually. And the first thing I want to say is that I, 
I don't know how many of you have seen Fantastic, Fantastic Fungi. It's a movie about mushrooms and psilocybin. And I saw it and, and I learned something in there that are, of course, as we know, our skulls and our brains have shifted over millennia. And in millennia ago, the back of our head was bigger and our forehead was much flatter like an animal's as like a cat or a dog or something. And then um, the, the back of the brain shrank, the back of the skull shrank and the, the cerebral cortex or the front came, got bigger. And what scientists think who have done this research that the cerebellum, which was the part of the brain that shrank was the part of the brain that helped us to enter into altered states, into non-ordinary reality. So that shrank. And then I wanna bring in my favorite neuroscientist, Ian McGilchrist, who I talk about all the time. He has become a template for me of what we're talking about here. And as we go through this, I'm gonna kind of focus on the right brain because the right brain has more to do with the soul, the feminine, the, he, the the heroine and different kind of research, Western scientific rationalism is really focused on the left brain. And Jung was trying to bring back, remember he uh, grew up and um, did his research at a time when Western scientific rationalism was at its height. It is, it is still is in many ways, but Physics came along at the beginning of the 20th century and began to question that. But anyway, so what McGilchrist did is he studied brains that uh, brain damage. What happens if a part of the brain is damaged? What happens? And he really developed and brought out the different perspective and the way the right and the left hemisphere look at and deal and relate to the world and the inner world. And what he realized, and Einstein said, Einstein said this too, that the right brain should be the master. That should be the foundation of our, where we make our deepest decisions. The left brain should be the emissary. McGilchrist would say the left brain should be the laptop. Like you have Einstein who had these revelations of relativity theory. And then he would go to his mathematical formulas and he would work it out on the laptop through his left brain. So let's go through this. The, the right brain is on, comes online at birth to about 18 months. It's the instinctual and the emotional brain it has to do with empathy, social and social relationships. It processes emotions, particularly sadness. It is whole bodily experience, the whole body image. It's implicit nonverbal communication. Only 7% of communication is words. The rest is um, posture, gesture, energy, intent, um, tone of voice. We all know that somebody can say something, the same thing in a different tone of voice, and it means something totally different. It has to do with context, gestalt, the complexity, meaning, deep meaning. And this is important. It holds ambiguous possibilities without interpretation. It loves paradox, and it mediates over a long period of time. The right brain knows the duration of time. The left brain is stuck in the here and now. It prefers novelty, uncertainty, and it's, it loves the symbolic. It looks for individual uniqueness and it is holistic. So the left brain, now they're both important, develops around 18 months. It's about separation, me, the ego. It's, what are my needs? Detachment. It sets aside affects. We learn to deny, which can be important, particularly this happens in trauma. It splits the body and the mind, and it has to do with anger and the predator. Now, if we think of when we had to go hunting, that predator was a particular way of really focusing and tuning in. And if somebody is constantly in anger, then they are stuck in the left brain. It has to do with explicit describable language. This is a cat, this is a laptop, this is a glass, this is whatever. But the right brain has to do with the meaning. It has direct focused attention. It analyzes, organizes, categorizes, and it's hierarchical. It abstracts, conceptualizes, manipulates to bring control and resolution. 
It gets stuck in fixed ideas. It wants to know what it knows. And it, it has trouble saying it doesn't know. It lacks discernible, discrete, literal uh, meaning, literal ideas, and it's short term. And so we see here where uh, any fanatical idea is, is really very much the left brain. And the left brain can't think of out of its outside of its own box. It gets in, it gets an idea and it builds on the idea and it keeps building on that idea. It can't bring in other possibilities. And it's about the explicit worldview. So this is one of Jung's paintings. He wrote, physicists today in general, oh, this is Marie Louise von Franz actually. Physicists today tend to regard the entire material universe as a cosmic dance of energy. David Bohm, a physicist who talked about the implicate order, which is the source cosmic consciousness outside time and space, and then the explicate order, which is about our time-space continuum, our reality, has outlined a projected model of the collective unconscious. This new image of the physical world can very well be associated with Jung's hypothesis of a single energy, which physically appears to be enfolded in space-time, but coexists psychically as pure, spaceless, timeless, enfolded intensity. So here, as Joe was talking about, we're beginning to see this relationship between energy enfolded in space-time and, and also timeless. So let's talk about the Sufis, because Henry Corbin was a Sufi uh, professor in Tehran. Uh, he was a colleague of Jung's, and he this is where Jung got the term subtle body. Henry Corbin was a Sufi scholar and probably re really a Sufi in his philosophy and his, um, his inner being. He says, Iranian Islam preserved the objective existence of the intermediate world. This is the mundus imaginalis. This is the world between our three-dimensional reality and the cosmos, the divine God. This is where the mystics and when we go into an altered state, this is where we go. It's between subtle, it's, it's in subtle body between this reality and outside of space-time at the same time. The world of subsistent images, alam al-mital. The imagination is the organ of this intermediate world. We can see in the coyote and in Jung's um, visions, this imagination is the organ of this intermediate realm, a reality in its fullest sense, though it is not the physical, sensory, historical reality of our material world, but it is real. As Jung said, said it was it is objective. Corbin also wrote, the world of the subtle body is indispensable if one wishes to describe a link between pure spirit and the material body. The power of the heart is the secret force or energy which perceives divine realities. The outer world is the microcosm and the inner world is the macrocosm. This is Coleman Barks who um, translated Rumi. Erica, we're not seeing a slide right now. If you meant were to you have- before? Were you before? Yeah, and now it's blank. Just yeah, yeah, minute. that's fine. I haven't brought up the words yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Jung said about the subtle body, it must necessarily be beyond space and time. See, we have it's hard to talk about this. It's hard to define it. Every real body fills space because it consists of matter, while the subtle body is said to not consist of matter or it is matter so exceedingly subtle that it cannot be perceived. We feel it. It's an energy. So it must be a body which does not fill space, a matter which is beyond space, and therefore it would be in no time. When we go into these experiences, whether it's in, in Egypt or on the, on, the, on the shore or in the unconscious, in the inner world, we're, we're outside of time. 
time seems uh, irrelevant. We might have an experience and we, and we think it's just been a minute and it's an hour. So it's timeless. It is beyond our grasp per definition. The subtle body is a transcendental concept which cannot be expressed in terms of our language or our philosophical views because they are all inside the categories of time space. So, um, so, the, so we're in the body and we're out of the body. So there is this sort of like an umbilical cord, maybe. When you think of a mystic like Teresa of Avila, I love that um, statue of her where she's just in an ecstasy. She's still connected on some level to her body, but she's not. Okay. It might be that the psyche should be understood as an unextended intensity, an unextended intensity, and not as a body moving with time. One might assume the psyche gradually rising from minute extensity, that means our body, to infinite intensity, transcending, for instance, the velocity of light, and thus e-realizing the body. Joe, that's what you were talking about. It's the body, but it's e-realizing the body. It's a subtle body. Okay. So let's talk, uh, to, as an example of this, let's talk about one of Jung's experiences. Jung went into the unconscious and he met his anima Salome. And Salome was blind. And he, he says, then a most disagreeable thing happened. Salome became very interested in me, and she assumed that I could cure her blindness. She began to worship me. I asked, why do you worship me? See, unexpected things happen. That's when we know we're actually in it. She replied, you're Christ. In spite of my objection, she maintained this. I said, this is madness, and became very skeptical with, with resistance. And when we meet these uh, inner figures, um, I mean, if, if an inner figure says that we're Christ, then we need to be skeptical. Then I saw the snake approach me. She came close and began to encircle me and press me in her coils. The coils reached up to my heart. I realized as I struggled that I had assumed the attitude of the crucifixion. In the agony and struggle, I sweated so profusely that the water flowed down on all sides of me. Then Salome rose and she could see. While the snake was pressing me, I felt that my face had taken on the face of an animal of prey, a lion or a tiger. Now this is, um, we can see that he's really in this experience because he's sweating and um, he's skeptical. He's conscious and he's totally allowing this to happen. Now, one thing that's interesting is Salome, his, his knowing of Salome is the Salome in the Bible, who was connected with the beheading of John the Baptist. Now, Salome was framed by the Catholic Church like Eve and Mary Magdalene and Lilith, and she was actually had nothing to do with John the Baptist. She was actually a very devoted and um, um, beloved disciple of Christ, and she preached. All women were equal um, in the early church. And she was at the resurrection with Mary and, Mag Mary and Mary Magdalene. So my little fantasy when I read this experience of Jung is like, well, maybe maybe he healed Salome's somehow. Maybe Salome's blindness got healed, and maybe Christianity got healed. That was just my little fantasy. Okay. Marion Woodman writes, the subtle body denies neither psyche nor soma, but brings them together in a tertium non detur, a third, which holds the physical and the psychic tensions and acts as a catalyst, releasing energy to both sides. One of the functions of analysis, or any kind of really strong, honoring, respectful holding environment, is to create a conscious container appropriate to the subtle body. So we go into these experiences and then we come out of them and then we have to go, what was that? How do I understand it? How do I come to terms with the energy of it? How do I, um, after I went through five years of my Kundalini experience, I, the Kundalini shot through my solar plexus 
and my headaches disappeared. So, and I was sobbing and my whole body was vibrating and there was tremendous energy in the palms of my hand and my feet. And I literally went around to people in the group and put, laid my hands on them. So there was some place for the energy to go. Okay, let's go back to the snake. This is an experience I've been working with a young woman in India who's an expressive arts therapist. She's, she easily goes into her body and her imagination. And she had a phobia of snakes. Um, her whole father's line had a phobia of snakes. When they would think about snakes or sna see a snake, they would, they would faint. So when we started working together, she stood up and she was, begin she was moving. And her body began to move, undulate like a snake. And this kept happening to her. And as she un allowed this experience to happen, her, her pelvis opened and her sexual energy moved and she really felt like a snake. And her phobia went away. She's still nervous about snakes, but she's not, she doesn't faint, she's not phobic. And so this is where um, I think it's really amazing the connection between the body and the mind. Um, and then just last week, she had this amazing dream. She's at home and there are baby snakes everywhere that just hatched. I'm scared and on the furniture and afraid to put my foot down. I feel creepy and creaky. I feel that I should kill them, but I don't. They're babies and they're not bothered by me. Then I'm on a mountaintop searching for goddess Parvati. There's an ancient building and a waterfall. I realize she is everywhere in nature. She is nature, as I see and feel her. Then there is a little beach, a small seed of golden light, shining tight outside my chest in front of my sternum. And in the dream, I'm supposed to walk into this little bead of light and let it occupy me. It wants to join my heart. So in her active imagination, she allows herself to go into the dream and walk into the bead of light and she's into, in a beautiful, subtle body, non-ordinary, altered state. Nathan schwartz Salat writes, if one can successfully work through the subtle body realm, there is often a chance to transform not only psychic structure, but physical structure as well. See, these are not separate. Mind-body splitting can mend when the subtle body realm is successfully encountered, like my headaches. Come on. Why is it not going forward? Okay. Okay. Esther Harding writes, the work of Jung was chiefly concerned with the contents of the collective unconscious. Now that doesn't mean that he dismissed the personal unconscious, which is our childhood. That was very important, as I said, our childhood carries the seed, our karma, the connection to the archetypal world. And we have to go through all of it. it Jung has demonstra demonstrated that it is only by coming into direct relationship to the superordinated values of the archetypal world in their numinosity that the individual can realize, make real his true individuality. But this result cannot be achieved through a mere intellectual understanding. So this is why interpretation doesn't just cut it unless the interpretation is right on and we resonate with it. So the inter when I work with people, I help, I try to find the interpretation from the person I'm working with. What does this mean? What, how does this resonate for you? Okay, so I'm gonna share a last big experience and then a small one, and then we'll come back and talk. And this is Jung. Jung had a near-death experience in 1944. So he was uh, 69 years old, something like that. He broke his foot and he had a heart attack. So he says, it seemed to me I was high up in space 
Its global shape was plainly distinguishable and its outline shone in a silvery gleam through that wonderful blue light. I knew that I was on the point of departing from the earth. The sight of the earth from this height was the most glorious thing I'd ever seen. I saw in space a tremendous dark block of stone. To the right of the entrance, a black Hindu sat silently in her lotus posture, and I knew he was expecting me. As I approached the steps, I had a feeling that everything had been sloughed away. Everything I had aimed at or wished for or thought, the whole phantasmagoria of earthly existence fell away or was stripped from me. It was an extremely painful process. Nevertheless, something remained. This is a painting he did of the history of, of humankind. Something remained. I consisted of my own history. This experience gave me a sense of extreme poverty, but at the same time of great fullness, for there was no longer anything I wanted or desired or any regret. I had everything I was, and that was everything. Then the doctor came and said that I, was, I had to go back to the earth. In reality, a good three weeks were still to pass before I could truly make up my mind to live again. Now I must return to the box system. By day, Jung was depressed, but at night he would enter a subtle body, visionary state. It was as if I were in an ecstasy. I felt as though I was floating in space as though I were safe in the womb of the universe, in a tremendous void, but filled with the highest possible feeling of happiness. This is eternal bliss, I thought. This, can be, this cannot be described. It is far too wonderful. This is a Berkhauser painting. In this subtle body state, Jung experienced himself in the mystic marriage, as it appears in the Kabbalistic tradition of Malkut and Teferat. I was the marriage, and my beatitude was that of a blissful wedding. Then there followed the marriage of the lamb. These were ineffable states of joy. Angels were present and light. I was myself, the marriage of the lamb. Then I walked up a wide valley. There were gentle chain of hills began, and it ended in a classical amphitheater. The Hierogamus, the sacred marriage, was being celebrated. All Father Zeus and Hera consummated the sacred marriage. All these experiences were glorious. Night after night, I floated in a state of purest bliss, thronged round with images of all creation. The visions would last about an hour. Then he would have to return to the gray world with its gray boxes. You know, when we come out of powerful experiences, no matter what they are, it, it's a transition back to this reality. And, and what does that have to do with this reality, which is the integration piece? Okay, one more. During the visions, there was a pneuma of inexpressible sanctity in the room, whose manifestation was the Mysterium Conjunctionis. The visions and experiences were utterly real. They all had a quality of absolute objectivity, as the ecstasy of a non-temporal state in which the present, past, and future are one, out of time. After this journey, I wrote it. This is how he integrated it. I wrote a good many of my principal works. The insight I had gave me the courage to undertake new formulations that people might not understand. Also, he felt, an affirmation of things as they are, an unconditional yes to that which is, an acceptance of my own nature, my true nature. I understood how important it is to affirm one's destiny. In this way, we forge an ego that does not break down when incomprehensible things happen. Murray Stein wrote, individuation, which is becoming who we truly are, our true nature, at its most basic level, re requires wedding instinct and archetype within the domain of consciousness. The marriage of instinct and archetype is the healing event. Now, um, so to me, there are different levels of healing. There's a, a very important process of 
dealing with our childhood, talking about it, sharing our secrets, um, working with our trauma. And then there's another level of healing, which is the archetypal realm, which was Jung's gift to uh, and the right brain, which, is the, which was his gift to psychology. Edward Edinger wrote, in every depth analysis, there is an individual, and where an individual goes through this experience and realizes the individual meaning of it to some extent in his or her own life, that individual is simultaneously contributing to the process of the transformation of the God image in the collective psyche, and hence is serving more than just a personal purpose. And here's one more. So this uh, is a quote from Mellon Thomas Benedict who had a near death experience. He went out of his body in his subtle body, out of his body into the cosmos and he was taught, he, he was trained as an initiate. And then he came back and he integrated this into his life and he speaks of it. He says, the body is the most magnificent light being there is. The body is a universe of incredible light. Spirit is not pushing us to dissolve the body. Spirit is not pushing us to dissolve the body. That is not what is happening. Stop trying to become God. God is becoming you here. The divine is incarnating in each one of us. So. Leonard Cohen wrote, love is the only engine of our survival. And Rumi wrote, people walk back and forth at the threshold. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. So I'm gonna just um, get out of this. Yeah. And I'm going to put up a bibliography if anybody wants to these are all books that I have, these are older books of people who have had experiences. So if you want to take a picture, if you want to email me or the Young Association, I'd be happy to send you um, a copy, you know, a copy of my the bibliography here. Um, so if anybody wants to take a picture or, or a screenshot, I don't know how to do that, but maybe some people do. Um, And, uh, and I just wanna scroll down a little bit. Here are some films that I think are quite amazing that speak to this whole phenomena. Now, when I would go in, I have been known to go into um, deep experiences. Mine were mostly energetic. And when I would come out, uh, several times I would come out of them, I'd get in my car and I'd run a red light. So we have to know that there is a threshold and that we, when we go over it, we need to take care and fully come back into our body. So, okay. Um, so if uh, I'll give you a few, few minutes here, just to, if you wanna look at this or take a picture or whatever. There are other ones. These are ones that I felt were, really solid and not just kind of new agey. So, and you can contact me if you'd like some more. All right, here we are back again with time to, time to share. I'm really sorry about the technical stuff. I didn't realize, yeah, that it would take us to the end. Anyway, okay, who would like to, ask a question or share something. This has been a lot of material. So uh, Joe, I hope you could kind of see how they, how they kind of, how the subtle body and the body and the mystical and the imaginal, um, the mundus, I love the word mundus imaginalis because it's, it's, a, it's like a world where we go to experience these things. Would anybody like to ask a question or share anything? I yeah, can. Still, I, I, can, it's Joe, can I just say, I still feel there is a difference, a differential between altered states of consciousness 
in which you have expanded consciousness and great imaginal experiences, but can be other than actual subtle bodies that can be projected outside, which there are many accounts of this. I uh, read the book, Michael Pollan, um, How mm -hmm. to Change Your Mind. There's mm -hmm. a whole list of things where people have left their physical body, traveled with their subtle body, an actual body, mm -hmm. and even um, it's just of a different materiality. It's of a different level of materiality, but it's an organized uh, materiality mm -hmm. and so it i would call that a subtle body okay. i would call yeah. all these other experiences altered stage of consciousness varied very varied altered states but all of them uh even a kundalini experience i wouldn't why, why would that be called a subtle body it's well, a transformation yeah. of energy within the body but not not necessarily a separate body. But but you're in a subtle body state. When I was in that kundalini state, I was doing things with my body that I could not have done in ordinary reality. So to me, Joe, it's kind of a continuum. You have you have lesser experiences, you know, that are that you're fully aware of your body. You go, you might go into a mystical experiences, experience like John the Cross, Rumi. Uh, Teresa of Avila, you might have a near-death experience where you actually go out into the cosmos. People travel in their subtle body, right? So to me, yeah. these are all speaking of the of the same thing, but on different sort of a continuum. That's okay. the way I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Anne, I think you had your hand up first. So I think Linda Mary was ahead of me. Oh, Linda Mary. Go ahead, Linda Mary. Okay. Um, I find all this stuff very strange indeed, uh -huh. and this is why I this is why I attended, you know, to try and understand uh, understand more. Um, it's not that I'm a stranger to a uh, mystical thing because I I read the mystics, I do contemplative prayer, I've mm -hmm. had ecstatic experiences, you know. Uh, it's not so. It's not that, but I just can't get this subtle body idea and I, I wrote some notes as you were speaking and you mm -hmm. said I think you said this Jung says the somatic unconscious becomes material because the body is our living unit and uh, so I I mean what does that mean that the somatic unconscious becomes material can you say anything about that so I mean it's very hard to talk about this stuff right because yeah. it it's not, it's not, I think the Sufis could talk about it. It's like they had words for it that we don't have. So we're trying to kind of talk around it. I mean, when you have a contemplative prayer experience, you are in a subtle body. So you're, you're beyond your body. You're in a state of openness, perhaps, or yes, yes. vibratory, um, wonderful, blissful feeling or um bigger than you are or and yeah um, i have it in nature too in nature yeah, yeah. yes so i'm i don't know i mean again it's sort of like sometimes when i'm in a in a energy state it's it's just a gentle one and i'm just aware of my body and aware that i'm out of my body and in my body and everything's sort of vibrating and then there are times like with this kundalini awakening when it shot through my solar plexus where I was just totally in a, um, a bigger state of expansion and vibration and um, this powerful energy was just coming through me. And then you get to mystics who are just um, not really aware of the body at all at that particular time, right? And they have to come back in. Yes. yes. So, um, so that's, it's hard to talk about. It's, it's outside of our time space because you're, you don't, you're kind of, you don't, um, you're not really aware of time. You know, I have to put a timer on <laughs> to bring me back at times, you know? Yes. Um, and that's, one thing that the witness does, the witness in authentic movement keeps time and, and oh. tells everybody, okay, time to bring your movement to an end. So, um, so it's, 
uh, uh, so it's inside, you know, it's this intersection, I think, for me, between the body and the cosmos or God and the sort of this in-between place. That's okay. kind of, yeah. Does that help? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It does help. Yes, thanks. Yeah, Anne. Yeah, I was. Well, I was well, let's let some other people. Yeah, go ahead, Anne. Yeah, I was so happy to see uh, Anne Yulinov's book, Attack by Poison Ivy, mm -hmm. on the list. And that was a deeply meaningful one for me because I think in our childhood and also uh, throughout, whether we're a dancer or whether we play sports or whatever we do, our feeling is that the we should have the body under control. Mm -hmm. And when the body is controlling us, <laughs> there's there's a, there's a sense of um, helplessness, I think, and um, frustration there. And that that duality or that who's in charge um, nature that we set up for ourselves. I think Anne Yulinov spoke beautifully, um, mm -hmm. talks about her struggle and her... Um, way of dealing with um, the horrible attacks of poison ivy and and its meaning for her and what it took for her to no longer you know be uh, incapacitated by that yeah and and that's the amazing thing isn't it i mean she these attacks of poison ivy were horrendous and eventually she worked through it in some way in her in her psyche soma in her body uh, somehow coming to grips with something and she wasn't so uh, susceptible to it. Yeah, it's fascinating. Okay, who do we have next? Leon, you haven't spoken. I just unmuted myself. So I'm just first uh, participant, first time. Peter mm -hmm. invited me as I'm challenged to get on. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for that, saying that. Telling yes, me. and, and uh, and I, as I was lead, uh, reading you uh, literature, scanning your resources, you know, I found Maladomo Samé there. Mm -hmm. so Maladomo Samé, all my, you know, I study with Maladoma. I have mm -hmm. all his books. Mm -hmm. So I think in my, you know, I raised my hand because there is some question arised about, you know, body or how to call these experiences. I think one of the things I learned from working or studying with Maladoma Sume, that language is just such a challenge. Mm -hmm. In particular, English language does mm -hmm. not describe, uh, it's not language of origin. If you would really uh, connect to people from South America or Mayans or anyone else, mm -hmm. their language, which is intonation, tones, and some other spiritual delivery delivers what the meaning. English language is not one of those languages. Right. So I think I understand the struggle. You know, I think the best way how to, and I haven't had some of these experiences you're describing, but uh, all of that is actually experiential, mm -hmm. and all of it is uh, not describable through language. I mean, yeah, we can say, where we experience some of that, I agree to that. Now, another component I wanted to add from my experiences is at least what I learned, precursor to this experience is ritualization, ritual. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ritual could be form of prayer, mm -hmm. you know, or any other kinds of movement or body movement. So all this experiences seems to be as a consistency with entering in space of ritual and then something happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if this energy get hold you know, properly and everything. Just another thing I wanted to share, because I think you mentioned, today I just came back from being on a beach in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like one of the best ritual I can do for myself mm -hmm. once in a while. So whoever stood by the edge of the ocean and look at the ever-changing time and space with sun setting, just another ritual space to, and then imagination comes in. Mm -hmm. Then one experiencing some kinds of imagination, because I think another word I wanted to use is awakening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that word awakening 
to some state is also a significant word to those experiences. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop right there. But uh, I like your presentation. Thank you. And uh, yeah. it's a lot to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's sad to me, um, like what my six, my experience at the age of 16 was an awakening. It was my first, it was sort of my first real conscious awakening. And I had many awakening experiences after that. But the, the sad thing for me is, as you said, the English language is really a kind of a left brain language. And the right brain with the intuition and the embodied states and the uh, emotion and the energy and the ability to tune in to other levels is... is it's another thing I would just want to bring to add to it. Mm -hmm. Language, which is incorporate tonality, like singing. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. another way how to deliver, you know, ritual, you know, that can change things with that yeah, language. Absolutely. If it's introducing some melody, you know, yeah. and all religious practices knew it. Yeah. yeah. They understood that this singing, either you go to Jewish mm -hmm. prayers or cantor singing, it changes everything. Or rhythm. You know? Or rhythm, exactly. Drumming. And that's another way. Yeah, indigenous cultures know this. Exactly. You know, this this and, is not new and, to indigenous and The last thing I wanted to say is just my it's question, because everything what I heard today, I've done different studies. Shamanic Journey, for instance, mm -hmm. with my uncle mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how do you, I guess, you know, I don't know your background, but... Um, how, yeah. do, how does not, one intellectualize shamanic experience? I guess that's my question. Well, I don't. I don't think you do. I mean, I. I mean, to me, Jung had a shamanic experience. You know, he went in and he, caught, he uh, encountered all kinds of strange and different creatures and parts of himself and wise old men and the devil and death and he. Um, I mean, to me, this is shamanic. This is a shamanic aspect. Yeah. And I think, um, I, like I said, when I, I was a child of the 60s and 70s and I did every drug there was, and I think one of the reasons I didn't have a spiritual experience then was because it wasn't set and setting. Back in the 60s and 70s, we just did it. But I think if there had been set and setting, I would have had a different experience. I mean, I didn't need psychedelics to have experiences, but yeah, yeah. Andrew. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm thinking about how this is beyond words, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and also I'm I'm just curious: is it observable? Uh, if I could play with that question for just a minute, mm -hmm. Jung is at his easel painting. Jung is walking by the the lake. Jung is chiseling a stone. The observer sees it. Jung is up in the middle of the night. Jung yeah. is weeping. Jung is writing. The observer would see those things, but Jung himself comes back from a journey and reports what happened in, mm -hmm. in the full array of experience. Mm -hmm. um, so what the observer from the outside has a sense of is pretty blunt compared to the self-report of the experience. Sure, sure. Well, I, I think that's right. I mean, when I'm uh, with somebody who's going into a subtle body state, um, I don't know what their journey is, but I can sense that's ah. where the right brain comes in. That's where we have lost this ability to be in the presence of and sense into and open to my own images as a witness, my own images, my own body sensations, which tell me a lot about what, what's happening in the other, the other person, even though I don't know exactly what their story is until they come out and tell me. But yeah. I can tell when they go into subtle body. Uh. But, but we can't this, as uh, Leon said, this has to be an experience. If you haven't had any inkling or experience of this, then you don't know how to see it. You know, your body probably isn't open to it. 
or or it might be, and you're just going, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. So that role, that role of the witness uh, relates for me to the intercessor role in in indigenous communities with vision yeah. quests. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think I think the witness is important because the witness sort of holds the space. It can be an inner witness. And when, when you learn to do authentic movement, you learn to develop your inner witness so that while you're going into experiences, you're all, I mean, Jung was conscious that he was going into experiences, you know, um, um, but, but you're sort of in and out and the deeper you go, the less here you are, right? Yeah, okay. So let's see, Sarah, do you wanna, or Darlene, I don't know who's first, but. Darlene had her hand up first. Darlene, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I was wondering if it's possible to have an outer body, body experience within a dream, almost like entering a realm within a realm. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I asked that is because I have this reoccurring dream um, that comes up on occasion of a young girl who's seven or eight years old. And when she appears in my dream, she's the only thing that's moving in the mm -hmm. dream. Everything mm -hmm. around her is frozen. Time is frozen. Mm -hmm. There's no movement, no life. She's wearing a sundress, it, you know, like a yellow bright sundress. And she's hopping along in the neighborhood and she's the only thing that's moving. It's almost like she's within her own realm. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that to be just very strange. And um, I don't know if that's an out of body experience within another realm. Well, I think dream, there are many ki different kinds of dream states, but yes, you can be awake in dreams. You can, there can be different um, um, realms in the dream or different worlds in the dream. Yeah, the dream world is quite uh, surprising and amazing. You know, and I mean, when you come out of a dream, then what I do with people is I help them to consciously go back into the dream and and uh, work with the dream from the inside. Okay, so you might try to contact her or talk to her in your do an active imagination with her. So, so you're saying, yes, it is possible to go into a dream and have another out-of-body experience within that dream. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if that's an out-of-body experience, but it's something very curious in the dream. Yeah, 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 interesting. Sarah? Um, so I'm interested in what you said about the personal unconscious being linked to our childhood versus the collective, which is more archetypal, kind of greater than us. Um, and I'm interested in like, would you say there's a difference in like the quality of having a subtle body experience in the personal unconscious versus the, like, and this mm -hmm. is, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with them, but would you say that those are that there would be like a difference in experience um, if you're experiencing kind of a subtle body or altered state in the personal versus in the collective. Like it seems like the personal might be more of like trauma or what someone might call dissociation versus a collective, which is might which to me feels like more of like will willfully or you know going into kind of a um, some kind of a journey and it seems if there is that difference, it's interesting to me that like, maybe you don't have as much of a choice about entering into the like personal unconscious in terms of trauma, whereas you do with the collective. So I don't know if that makes sense because my mind is like trying to wrap around kind of <laughs> um, difficult things to articulate, but I'm just curious about that. Yeah, uh, the personal unconscious, I mean, it holds our trauma, right? I mean, that's, uh, those are our memories of our trauma and our body's memory of the trauma. And, uh, and uh, it's kind of like different levels of working on it. When, mm -hmm. we, when we really go into the childhood and 
uh, talk about the memories and the experiences and the relationships, that's crucial. Um, uh, and I'm not sure when you're talking about it, you, uh, you may slip into a subtle body space. I see dissociation as a subtle body space um, because that trauma takes you into that place or that, you know. So to me, again, it's kind of a, but in those, say, um, say, let's say, take the mother, we all have the mother, and there's our personal mother, but there's an archetypal mother. So the archetypal mother is the, the mother that colors our experience of our personal mother. So we need to work with the personal mother to uncouple that from the great mother so we can have a real relationship with her. But we also have to come to grips with what, how that created our relationship to the great mother, right? And that's more on the archetypal level. Mm -hmm. So to me, they're, they're all part of the healing process, the whole healing process, but they're kind of like different dimensions of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. 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 Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for being patient with the technical stuff. I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, and, um, and I hope we see you next month. Thank you very much. Good night.